Well, yeah, interesting. Well, just as an aside, so those those all those kind of um, extreme sports like uh, like the squirrel suits, big wave surfing, um, e and even things that aren't that extreme, maybe, but like skateboarding and stuff. Um, it's been really remarkable how those sports have evolved really rapidly over very short periods of time. Like people that, um, say with big wave surfing, 10 years ago or even five years ago, guys wouldn't be able to get into the really big waves on the north side of Oahu or uh, Chiapu in uh, Tahiti. And all. They had to be towed in. The first, the first guys to do it were being towed in on ski doos into the wave and then they'd ride the wave. And even that was like incredibly dangerous. He's, you know, 50 foot waves and these guys would ride it. Now, those guys are able to paddle in and they just drop in off the top of the wave. It's like dropping down eight stories, you know, and, and they are able to ride it. And that was unheard of. And people used to get killed doing that or really, really injured. And uh, plus, if you fall, you have to be able to hold your breath for about three minutes or so to four minutes which is really, have you ever tried to do that? That's really hard. It's hard to hold your breath for, for a minute underwater when you're tumbling around and stuff. And if you can't hold, so those guys practice really holding their breath. They have all this kind of, and that stuff has happened very quickly. And um, they've used those kind of, uh, those sports to study something called flow states. Have you heard of flow states? Flow states are, um, there was a book, this guy, Mahai, Michik Mahai, he's a, a, a Czech, I think, back in the 80s wrote about how, you know, those kind of states when you get into where everything goes perfect, say in sports or playing a musical instrument where time slows down, you're totally in focus, or even driving and, you know, every light is green or your day just goes right, you know, those kind of states. And then there's other times like where everything's not going right, but there's some times when things just flow. And he was studying those kind of states and trying to figure out how to replicate them so that sports figures and stuff could get in those states and perform at their peak you know, whenever they needed to. And it was really hard to find situations where they could study that. Well, a couple of guys about uh, in the last five years or so, one guy from Wired, a guy named Stephen Kotler, who actually lives up in, uh, in Chimayo, um, and, uh, but he's a, a big writer. He has a, 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 a re rescue operation for Chihuahuas up there. And he sort of, you know, went off the off grid to just live and write and stuff. And his partner, Dr. Jamie Weil, they've come up with this whole flow state type of uh, uh, practice. And the way they did that was um, Kotler was writing for, I think, Wired and Outside Magazine, and he was one of those extreme athletes. And every once in a while, he'd get injured, and he'd be injured for like six months, and he'd come back, and everybody was doing you know, uh, stunts that they couldn't do six months ago. And it's like, how can they do that? How are they, how are these double ollie grinds or whatever for, you know, skateboarding, suddenly you couldn't do it, and now there's, you know, three dozen people that can do it. Um, and, and even things like, so they discovered that uh, there was ways to study these, and they used these different uh, people that are, you know, big wave surfers or squirrel suit guys and stuff that, uh, because if they're not, because they claim they're in, in flow states. And they know de facto that they are because if they weren't, they would die, right? If you panic for one second in a, in a you know, the squirrel suit, you're gonna fall off the thing or something. Even if, say, if you're doing a dive and you do a backflip or something, if you, you know, that thing where you're halfway through, you get scared, you're not gonna be able to do it. So you have to be in those flow states to do it. So they started studying all those kind of uh, folks and all and found out the different uh, biochemistry, neuro, you know, chemistries of how to get into these states and have helped people to, to get into them. Really fascinating work. But, uh, like to get in that state. Yeah, right? That I, well, well but th that's what their whole thing is. How do, you, how do you get into those states so you can perform at your best? And anything you do, you know. Um, Sounds so. kind of like zen a little bit. It is. It's very zen. And at first they thought that it was uh, hyper attention of the frontal cortex and stuff. And what it turns out to be is you actually turn off all that frontal cortex and go into some sort of autopilot mode. But there's a whole neurochemical cocktail, you know, of epinephrine and, and, uh, and uh, endorphins and stuff that trigger at different times and on, and how you make that happen. And basically, you have to get your focus. And you have to basically have, um, uh, let's see if I can do this. You have to be able to, this, it's, it's, there's a thing called a flow channel where your skill sets have to be relatively just a little bit more challenging than, um, than what you're able to do. 
So it has to really, you have to be really focused. It has to be something that's super challenging to you. Um, These things don't work so well. So something, something along these lines. Say, say if you have a graph, right? And this is your skills. And this is, uh, uh, I forget now, actually. But there's a, a performance thing here where your skills have to be about as, as good as the, uh, what, what, the, what, the, uh, what the task is, right? So the task and skills have to be about the same. If the, if the task, if the skills aren't really required for the task, then you get into boredom. And if the task, if you don't have the skills to get to do the task, then you're in stress mode, right? So you have to be right in this middle sort of, they call that the flow channel. Hmm. And, uh, so, you know, really interesting stuff. And it has a lot to do with marketing. But I don't know what actually. Right off the top of my head. So the higher the task, the higher the skill you have. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. If the task is going to be, you know, you have to then have the skills. To, if you don't have the skills to do it, you're going to be so totally you stressed. If you have high task and low skills, you're going to be stressed out. You're going to be stressed. But if it's a low task and you have high skills, then you're going to be bored. And you have to be right in that sort of middle range, you know, where the, they say that the task has to be about six percent higher than your skill set to keep you really engaged and mm -hmm. performing. I don't know where you come up with six percent and how you even measure that stuff, but. That's what they so said. So what did you guys think of the marketing stuff? And do you have any questions about marketing before I get cranking here? Actually, I looked up the wisdom of crowds thing that you were talking about. Oh, excellent. I think he wrote it in 2004 or something. But yeah. I was just wondering like, how that plays out now with social media and everything. You know, like it, one of the things is decentralization, individualism, and like, you know, everybody can't be at the same mindset, you know, but now it seems like we're so polarized and like, I mean, this is politically, but mm -hmm. just in general, it seems like everybody, there's not a whole lot of diversity in, in the way we're thinking. I mean, there still is that are out there, but what I'm saying is this, if you're marketing a product, I'm wondering how, if that still works and how it actually works with the wisdom of crowds. Concept. Well. And those are those are very good points. The uh, the, the wisdom of crowds uh, will predict will predict things. The um, but you're right. We are we are very sort of bifurcated and polarized in this country, especially. It seems like we've gone in, and that's nothing new, really. I mean, think back to the Civil War, right? I mean, the, these things have been happening all yeah, along. You just read about it instantly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, right. Now now we have these instant sort of uh, feedback, and 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 we have these, and also we have these. Uh, the sources that play into our confirmation biases, right? Where we think a certain way, and so we seek out media that confirms the way we're thinking, and that sort of is a feedback loop. Instead of getting uh, different opinions that sort of challenge maybe what we're thinking. Oh, I never thought of it that way. That's a good point. Okay, you know. And uh, so that I think is added to this sort of spinning off in these sort of uh, you know bi bifurcated or bipolar kind of kind of ways, but. With, with products, yeah, you have segmentation, right? And you have markets that um, you're segmenting into different groups and targeting those markets and position your products within it. Um, and you can do that on a really refined basis now, based especially like on Facebook, where they have all these, you know, think about all the likes and everything you click on, and Google too, you know, the, that sort of, they get a really good idea of where you are. If, if you're part of a group that likes this thing, and then you're also part of a group that likes this thing, and you're part of a group that likes this thing. Uh, but where that all these overlap is a relatively micro-targeted group, they can you can really refine it to that kind of that kind of level. Um, but at, you know, to your to your question there, how this works with marketing, that's what everybody's trying to figure out. Um, speaking of which, um, we talked the other day about, and it was just happening that Colin Kaepernick. Nike ad campaign, and Nike just had it before one of the one of the games the other uh, yesterday. And uh, do you know how that's been playing out? Well, I read Nike sales have surged thirty one percent. Yeah, right. Wow. So it took an initial dip and then it surged. Well, the stock took a dip. Right. The stock took a dip, but the sales 
the have gone up. So now the, 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 the stock is going to go up to follow the sales. Right. because The stock took a dip readily, originally thinking, oh my gosh, sales are going to go down. And the opposite has happened. That's a third. Sales went up by a third. That's, that's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, that's more than they could have possibly have thought they were going to get from, from, uh, from, from this kind of a, a campaign. But pretty, pretty remarkable. Well, like you said, it's a global company, right? It is a global company, yeah, and and that so that plays into it too. Uh, today's Monday Night Football, right? Who's playing tonight? You must know. Oh, I got my, the fancy quarterback's mind. Uh, who's it? Uh, Stafford. So he's um, who's Stafford play for? Uh, that's the Lions. Yeah, the Lions. Lions. Lions, and then there's who, who's the other team? <laughs> and see, we can look Lions. it up. But it's it's Monday Night Football, right? right. And yesterday was Sunday Football. And, and you guys love football, you know about it. Well, you don't know that great much. I'm kind of embarrassed. Right. See, great game last night. How about you two? Are you? I don't understand American football. You don't understand it. You're not that interested. To you, football means soccer, right? And it's all Ronaldo and uh, Pele and who else are the other big players, you know? Reinhold Messi. Neymar. All these, you know, so that's a different... And Cleveland yesterday, they were having a game, and it was Cleveland against uh, uh, Steelers, Pittsburgh, and they were supposed to have that the remnants of the tropical storm was going to be moving into Cleveland, and they thought it was going to be like eight inches of rain and wind, but they played the game. It was a tie, which is unusual, but, uh, but they played the game. So I just wanted to, this is, lose, which and the Browns didn't lose. They're not going to go 16-0 and 0 or 0-16. Or 0 um, but what I wanted to, the point is that when we talk about segmentation of markets, right, you guys know football? You women don't really know American football. So th that's a segmentation, right? You're gonna, you, would, you would craft your messaging of your product in two different ways for different markets of, of people. That, that, so that's just an example of, uh, of uh, you know, and, and, and football is amazing, American football as a, uh, as just as a product when you think about it, you know? It's, it hasn't been this popular. Right now, I'd say it's probably the most popular sport in the United States, right, by far. And, but it's, it wasn't always that case. Back in the 50s and stuff, it was a backwater sport. No one knew about it. What was the big sport back then? Baseball, Baseball right? Baseball, Baseball was a thing, and it was America's pastime, all that kind of stuff. And one of the remnants of American football that goes back to the vestiges of the old days, Green Bay Packers. Why would you have a team in Green Bay, Wisconsin? It's kooky. But it's because they were all in these little backwater towns and it was really not of that interest. And what changed was television came along. And suddenly, then that's something as a product and it, that, that football didn't say, you know what, we're gonna get this whole league together because we think in 20 years, this thing, you know, television is going to come along and it's going to be in everybody's home and then they're going to figure out how to do slow motion and isolated cameras and our sport is just going to be perfectly paced for this new medium to be delivered to it and all. It was just luck, right? Absolutely luck. And what's happened, baseball now is trying to re-engineer itself because it's too boring, it's slow. It, well, it's not slow, it's slow for TV, but it's not necessarily a slow game. Yeah, they have all these ways to try to speed up the game to make it more interesting for television. Uh, it's because television has become the dominant channel to deliver these these products, right? And and what the point I'm making there too with marketing is it's not always something that's preconceived. It's sometimes it's just you're lucky, you're in the right place, and that happens. And so then with football too, just as to extend this sort of metaphor, but uh, so so football lucked out with with um, with television got huge pay increases and then all that went down through free agency and all to the players to giant contracts, lots of money going around. But everybody had their favorite team, right? You, you know, wherever you were from. And around here, people either have Phoenix or Dallas Cowboys or Denver, or if you live in New York, you like a New York team, you don't like the, you know, the, the Dallas team. You know, and everybody sort of congeals or clusters around their, uh, yeah. their, their geographic place for their team. And so you would only watch your team when it's playing. Oh, my team's playing on Sunday, and they watch the Thursday night game or the Monday night game or whatever. I'm not that interested in it because it's not my team, and I'm just caring about that. But then football lucked out again in an amazing way about maybe five years ago or so with the fantasy leagues. 
Suddenly, and fantasy leagues are these where people that are really into football pick their pick players from different teams and make a team out of those players, and then how those players perform, they can win or lose in uh, in the in the little league they make up. Is that yeah, accurate, points, kind of? Yeah, it's at points. And actually, you said something that because I'm not a huge football fan, but I do fantasy every year. My wife's actually our fo the football buff in our family. Interesting. And it puts me to watch football because, and so well, I'm actually brought into Brazil. football because because of, you have because yeah. of the soccer. fantasy. Mm -hmm. okay. For soccer, we have in Brazil. You have fantasy, fantasy for fantasy soccer. Fantasy is a soccer. Different name. But but I mean, where you yeah. where you. And it could be somebody from Madrid Real and somebody yeah. from Manchester United, and you have these, and how those players play, then you win. So that suddenly it expanded, like, like you were brought in yeah. to football because of fantasy, and other people that just were really interested in their one team, suddenly I got to see how the Atlanta Falcons are doing because I got a couple guys on fantasy on that one. You know, and suddenly it broadened out everybody's idea of what to watch for football games, and again, the NFL didn't mastermind fantasy. That was sort of a grassroots thing that came right up, right? And then, like, g people around their kitchen tables thinking of this and all, and then it came up through apps and everything, and now it's become a really big thing. Do you play fantasy? I don't, actually. My do you? Does, but. but you know people are doing You know what it is, right? I don't play at all, but, and so I mean, my explanation of it might not be totally right. But I always lose, but it's So here's the other thing about football and all sports, basically. The dirty little secret, right? It's all about gambling. Yeah. It's all about gambling. That's why people watch it because everybody's in, you know, in uh, little, you know, leagues or pots or whatever like that, or with their bookie well, and they're booking. We, we put money into it. So. Yeah, it's all. I mean, it's money. It's gambling, and and it's not supposed to be about gambling, but that's really why a lot of people watch into, you know, their bookie and you know, okay, what's the over under, you know, on on the game tonight and stuff like that, and and people are really into gambling, and that's what drives a lot of the obsessive watching. Uh, it's not just about, I'm just a sports fan, you know, it's like. What's the name of the company that started last year or year before? A couple and, years ago. and there's a lot of sports, online betting and online stuff like betting. that. And then they just make oh, that legal yeah, too, yeah. right? They just made that legal. I, that's what I'm saying, I think it's legal. It's, they just made it legal, so that's giving it another level. So when you think about creating product and creating, lot, you know. I, know some, I have a buddy that does, and so yeah, he uses that. Yeah, it's, it's so th th this product has evolved over time, and not just the game has evolved, but the channels and the audience has been expanded through all these kind of machinations that aren't necessarily pre-planned by the masterminds of, of the product themselves, you know, but, uh, but these are all marketing type of uh, uh, evolutions, right, of that game. And I just picked football as one model because it has sort of a, a lineage that, uh, that we can talk about. So when we're thinking about, just to go right back to basics, right, when we're thinking about marketing, we're thinking about companies, right, basically, or, or entities, but let's just call it a company, right? So there's this famous saying, and it's attributed to a bunch of people, but Robert Benchley who was a writer, you know, that uh, there's two kinds of people, people that divide things into two categories and people who don't. Sort of a funny, you've heard that? And so, in this case, let's divide a company into two categories, right? What would you think would be the basic categories of a company? I don't know how to say this, you know, to, to get, get you thinking. Sales about. operations? Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what I was looking for. And, and broaden more than sales, right? Sales is part of it, but the bigger rubric is marketing, right? Marketing has sales, advertising, promotion, all that kind of stuff comes under it. But yeah, sales, and on the other side is operations. So this is sort of the, the outward facing stuff that, you know, customer facing, right? You're looking at customers here. And this is the inward, this is the inward facing stuff, the operations, right? Getting all of your supplies into the company and making whatever it's gonna be that you're making, right? And then it goes out into the marketing world. So when you think about companies, there's you can really think about it in these two kind of ways. So we're, when we're talking about marketing, we're basically talking about all the outward facing type of uh, activities. Make sense? Just to keep it really simple, that's what we're doing. And these things have changed dramatically 
now with social media and and uh, digital downloads, things like that, that uh, allow us to do marketing in in new new ways. But it's it's still the same. And that's what we were talking about last week was the different ways to do marketing um, that haven't changed the messaging and you know even going back to to Aida you know 1880s and it's attention uh, interest desire and action same thing that's what they all it's the same way that you do it in in digital marketing they call it a marketing funnel and it's basically what you're doing is you're you're doing attention and then you're, you're gaining interest and you're creating desire and then you then you your last call to action is to be a to purchase right and so we're going to talk more about those kind of steps and how they work in digital marketing um, the other thing that we talked about was another sort of uh, uh, paradigm acronym for marketing was the four P's right and anybody remember what those are kind of or? Product, price, promotion, promotion. and place, yeah. And place, kind of a reach because they had to make it another P, right? You know, but, but place just means distribution, channels. How do you get your, your stuff to the, to the people? And there's a, there's a great, I mean, there's a, a saying about marketing, right, that it's delivering the right message, right? The right message about the right product at the right place at the right time to the right person, right? And that kind of maps to these P's, right? That you're trying to get your product at the right place at the right time. And that's one of the beauties of, like we were talking about Google um, and, and search as a marketing tool, um, is that you're already the right time in the right place because you're, you're selling the intention. People that put in that phrase, whatever it is, type that in and then your ad comes up. So you're already quite, you're, into, you're into, into this place right away. So that's the beautiful thing about um, search, using search keywords in search marketing. I bought a brass fitting for a 7 on blazer that I just got. And for a what? I'm fixing it up. But what is it? A brass fitting. For what? It's, it's on the back of the old pressure gauge. A pressure gauge? Uh -huh. oh. So it goes from the, the engine to the old pressure gauge. Uh -huh. I stripped it up, I was taking the dash off. Um, and I was reading an article, and the, another brass fitting came up. Same thing came up. I couldn't believe it. Like, I, it's just in the middle of my article. I, I mean, I'm not going to buy a lot of brass fittings, I don't, but this one just popped up. So it's amazing. Popped up it's, in it's the amazing. article. Just, yep. And we're bombarded. It was huge, too. It wasn't this small, it was a huge brass fitting. And, you, um, huge brass fitting. Brass fittings on my Ed? Or, my stuff before. Uh huh. So. Yeah, the, the way that they... What's that? Cookie? I guess so. I don't know. It's just weird. Because when you, when you search for it, then it tags the cookie, and then you're going to see it like in... And then I wonder if it also right. felt or knew that I finalized it, too, because it literally now is hitting me up for brass fittings. I don't know. Maybe they saw that I searched for it, but it's also... I don't know. Maybe they can correlate it by bought it or not. <laughs> that's what you're I don't really want the darn thing. Yeah, exactly. I know. Like, that's the, I don't want any more brass <laughs> They, that's the problem that they'll keep. They'll keep. I, I don't think they're that smart yet that they don't keep tossing the, uh, the 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 ad in front of you. But yeah, um, if do any of you have a blog or have thought about writing a blog or anything? Well, if you have a if you have a website, you right? Have one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on. Actually, it's on Medium. You should check it out. Actually, actually those articles that I sent you are all from my blog. Does it tie back to your blog? Yeah, if you click on that, it goes to my blog, okay. yeah, and you can follow me there. I, I actually, I used to do it on my website. My website is uh, made in, in a platform called WordPress, and WordPress, it powers about 30% of the web still. You know, it's really remarkable. Um, and it's a simple way to make websites. It started out as a blogging platform, and then little by little became more of, a, of a, just a, a website platform. But it's really good for blogging. And so you can set it up, and you can set up your blog, and you can start blogging and all. But to, to get any uh, traffic to you, th then, you know, how do you get people to come and read your blog? It's just there. Well, how is anybody going to know about it? Well, you have to start figuring out how to e either on Twitter or other social media, maybe have a picture and a link to your blog, and then hopefully your some of your followers there or something will go and read it. Or somehow you have to try to generate some, uh, some uh, 
activity to it. So that's, that's one thing that's difficult. And the other is measuring how many people came and read it, how long did they stay on the page, did they actually read it, did they like it, and you can do all that with Google Analytics, but that gets cumbersome. You have to learn how to use Google Analytics and you have to put that into your site and then you have to go to the Google Analytics you know, page and find that all out. And so I was doing that. And it's easy enough to blog. You type your stuff just like a word processor and you load it up and you can put pictures in and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one thing not to do is when I first started, I, uh, I just Googled some pictures and went on the web, grabbed a picture and uh, it turned out that it was copyrighted by this firm in Toronto or something, and oh. they they sent me a a, le a letter, and I ended up I had to settle with them for like eight hundred bucks to to because I used and I put it that pull it down immediately, and they're like, what's the big deal? And so they, they kept sending me right. stuff. Oh, I had to go get my attorney to write them letters, and we went back and forth. And so you really got to be careful about taking images. If you go and search well, images, you, hmm? you, yeah, they, and they do that. They have these tracking cookies in there, and so they know when somebody takes their picture and uses it. And so, and that's, that's how they make money. It's a racket, yeah. And I was shocked and, uh, cause I thought, oh yeah, these pictures are out there, it's free, we, and, uh, but um, you can, on, if you go on Google and, and Google something and click on images, you can find a lot of images. And then there's a tool saying, you go to tools and then it says usage rights and you can click a down thing there and uh, you can usage rights that are allowed for reusage or, you know, uh, and then you can take those and use those without as you know a problem but what I do now is there's three great sites um, Unsplash, Pexels and Pixabay and they have high resolution photographs of people beautiful photographs like the kind you see in real yeah, magazines and stuff and they're all um, you don't have to pay for it and you can use them well, and so whoop whoop the, oh people perk up um, Unsplash and Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-Y, and uh, Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S. And just go check out their sites because the pictures are gorgeous. And you can, you can, and then there's, when you download the picture, um, the, you know, it'll say, you know, thank the, you can thank the, uh, the artist um, on Facebook or Twitter. And I usually just click on Twitter and send a thanks to them. And a lot of times they actually, you know, they're, they're watching that and they say, oh, thanks for using my picture and stuff. It's really, so you can use those and those are good. Good, because that's one thing that makes articles more sticky and interesting to people if there's if there's images with it and I good images. Slide decks out and begin to look at. Yeah, if you can use them for slide decks, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, um, and so they're they're that's a really good image sources. But our company marketing department they sent us these websites just in case like we wanted to advertise for ah. our programs or because we do like you know. If you put up a brochure, a flyer, yeah. right? You can use those okay, pictures. So they send Right, because you don't want to get you don't want to get in trouble for that and have because it would be a lot more money if it's a company with deep pockets than little old me. But the uh, yeah, so exactly. So you can and you can. There's pictures of every, anything you want. You know, sunset or people having fun or whatever. You know, and uh, it's it's really they're really good, um, and it's really fun to just put in words and then see what pictures come up too. It's it's interesting that they have them all keyed to these different activities and words. But another thing in, in a blog then is through Google, there's um, Google AdSense it's called. And you go to Google AdSense, you set up an account, and it gives you this um, uh, code, right? A little bit of HTML code is the code that is used in, in um, front end of websites. So front end of the web. So when you're doing, when you're doing the web, there's, there's a couple things. You have the front end, that's the stuff that we see on our computer screen. And then you have all this middleware uh, which is all the, the stuff that gets it to that screen, basically. And then you have all this, the, the back end stuff, which is all basically databases and things when you're searching, right? And so uh, computer code, when you're a full stack web developer, you know how to do this whole stack, right? That's a, they call that a technical stack. Um, but if you're just a front end developer, you'll know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those are the three things that build build the front end of the website. Well, it gives you a little bit of HTML code. You don't even have to know that. You just copy it, you paste it into you know, your, your website in one of your little, you, know, you, you build your web pages with little chunks, basically, and you can have it in you know, two or three or something like that if you do it in one. And then what it'll do is um, Google will populate that space in your articles with an ad, like the one for your, uh, for your brass fitting, 
that are germane to the subject matter of your text. And so people can do banner ad, people buy banner ads and they don't really care where they're, they don't, you know, where they're gonna be presented. They know that Google's gonna efficiently put them in the best places that are, that are gonna get the most clicks and stuff. So, and then they only pay if somebody clicks on that ad. So they knew you, you were probably on an on a automotive blog or something, right? And so they knew, oh, this is germane to that. Plus they knew that you would search for that and they put that dynamically, that ad just for you right into that little place there. And then if you clicked on it and you happened to buy that product or a product from that, that portaled you to that place, the person that had that blog or whatever would get paid. Yeah, but click on the different are, ads, right? Yeah. But the cookies are, the, the, the cookies are, are, are basically right. tracking yeah. pixel, pixels that are on every website. So if you go, if you just go on the web, oh, you're, you're getting those, those and they, they track what each site you go to. Now, yeah, you can go through and clear the contents of your browser and that'll clear all your cookies. The problem is, then it clears all of your passwords that you had and everything. I said, oh, now I gotta put my passwords back in for this site where it knew that. And so some, it's a balance between, do I really wanna clear my cookies now? And then every, t you know, my next, you know, 100 searches are gonna have, every site I go on, I'm gonna have to put in my Facebook again. I'm gonna have to put in my, you know, uh, Twitter account. I, I never sign up for something else with my Facebook account. I just, I, I, for some reason it makes me kind of I don't do that either, and yeah, because that's what they do is they then they get all of your friends' data and all of that all that information, and that's what they want to do is is gather that information. So yeah, I always do it with my email address and a password. Um, so yeah, we're kind of foiling some of these operations, but. You don't like that. They they you know that that happened with well with the uh, with the past election and that that group Cambridge Analytica. Um, which gathered a bunch of information on people and then used that to then target them with specific ads and find the people that would be most susceptible to certain type of messaging. And they got that, a lot of that information was coming through Facebook, where Facebook supposedly was very protective of information, not just for privacy reasons, because that's their bread and butter. They don't want to give that stuff away. But there were these um, different sites that um, came along and I never fell for them, but maybe you did and I just luckily didn't. But it was like stuff like, which beetle are you most like? Or exactly. what animal are you like? And that kind of stuff. And, and if you clicked on that and went through that kind of thing, they got all your information and they gathered so up they got the information, tons. But did, was some of that was, was telling them like stuff that you have the way you think? Well, you, it, it, but it allowed them to get all of your information from oh, Facebook oh, and, and uh, because you had to say, allow me to sign oh, up dude, through I Facebook or something like that. Them. And they got all, right. they got all right. this stuff. So they've, they've, they've since then tried to limit that kind of information. But then, then the, a lot of the information a guy gathered and he was at um, Cambridge University and he was just doing it supposedly for research and that was supposed to be okay. But then he sold it to this company and then the Mercers and these other folks, you know, bought it and started making all this, you know, kind of stuff happen. Very, very high tech and very sort of circuitous, but then it comes back and they use that for, for messaging. Um, so yeah, we do have to watch out for what we allow and how we go on these different sites so and then what kind of stuff free, we do. You know, that they're free, but they're not free. You know, like you gotta pay, so you're paying, we're paying a price because we're the product. But, but. There's no free lunch, right. These services are free, right, but we're not the, we're not the customer, we're the product. At the end of the day, what we're giving away is all of our, all of our information. Yeah. Uh, I never read any. Who reads that? Who has time to read that stuff? Yeah. The the whole. I I agree to this, and you know you're going to scroll and say, I'm not going to read all this. I just agree and click because you want to get to the thing. But who knows what's in there about? Yeah. You know, we can follow you anywhere and da 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 da. Even when you read it, like sometimes, like I. Well, it's technical jargon. It's just like you know, it's like the words are not really clear. It's all legal. Unless you're a lawyer. Well, they 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 obscure it on purpose uh, on purpose too. They make it so it's hard to understand because yeah. they don't want you to understand it. Just like reading, you know, the uh, finance documents or something or at the a first, lease. or a uh, lease or something for you know if you're going to buy a car and here's the finance what APR and this and that and you know 
<laughs> they, they do all this kind of stuff to try to confuse us. Or when you go to buy a house, ever do that? There's a stack of papers this big. But it's and there's, it, but it's just there, like, Oh, this is just something for this, and this is just the da 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 da. And you look, it's eight pages. Well, I can't have time to read it. I sign it, and you, you sign this giant, okay, thank you very much. You take all the documents, you know, hope to God you didn't sign something that, uh, you know, will come back to haunt you. Um, yeah, really, it's challenging. And we sign so many things. Any app you go on or something, there's all this stuff. And have you noticed lately now that um, all of the sites you go on have that little disclaimer that this site uses cookies to blah, 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 blah. Do you agree with that? Or, you know, yeah. are you allowed? And it's like, oh, I, would, I know what to do. I just click on the X because I don't want to confirm that I do or not. But by doing that, I probably am. That's because now we, uh, in the United States, the, all these international um, uh, sites and social media companies have to comply with these new European restrictions that are more restrictive. And so we're kind of the beneficiaries of their privacy laws, or at least they're telling us that they're shafting you, us. But you still want to read the article or whatever, so you're still going to click on that. Yeah, yeah. Or, I, or you cannot, but then you're, then, you're, then you're out. So you right. ponder for one second, and then you click on it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that coming up. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah that, and that's all, be, that's all because of uh, European laws are insisting on that now. You just have to warn everyone that we're, we're all still going to click on it. It's crazy. That's right. We're, we're going we're gonna to take all your data and we're going to use it to make you do things you really don't want to do. Do you agree? Okay. Yeah. I mean, basically, <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's the five, subtext. I'm read this article for five minutes. <laughs> and that's something that's happened, too, with, uh, you know, e even the way we read now and the way we, we get, gather our news, you know, we don't have, there's all this great... Um, sort of liberty and freedoms now that there's no gatekeepers, right? Anybody can write their stuff and get it out there. You can make a record and you don't have to worry about the record company or you can, you know, write a book and you don't have to worry about it has to be an editor at Random House has to like it. You can just publish it, you know, so all that. But on the other side, um, those curators and those editors and those people that put together magazines and newspapers where there was a whole bunch of articles and stuff, now we just read just onesies, right? You know, you go, oh, it's an Atlantic article? Oh, that's Vox, that's, you know, uh, Upworthy or, or Huffington Post or whatever it is, you know, Fox News. We're just reading the one thing. We're not, we're not, we don't have to get the whole magazine and see the whole New Yorker or, you know, Wired or whatever it is. We just get the one article and, sh and even stuff like that. I mean, that's an amazing information thing, right? I saw that article. I was able to say, oh, I think you guys might be interested and send it off and you guys can read it and we can all disseminate this information. Um, and then hope that the sources are credible, or kind of do some, you know, critical That's thinking. That's the only scary part. Is it's not going to be published for print, and it's instant. So you get a lot of these people that come out and they do something quick, and it's like, well, then it, you know, then it comes out. Well, they they jump the gun too quickly. So back then, yeah. on the papers, you know, at least it, it took twenty four hours to get a paper out. Well, that's true. Things things happen so so fast. There's, and I mean, incredible sites that and and these stayed, you know, really conservative news sites that have really prided themselves on having noble ambitions and having, you know, going after higher truths and all that kind of stuff and really vetting their sources and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, they have to compete with these ones that just, there's a thing called Upworthy. You've heard of Upworthy? Upworthy is a site and that was made and incredibly successful. And basically what they do is primarily take a bunch of uh, uh, articles, videos, graphics, things from other sources that are relatively obscure, and then they put super duper clickbaity uh, headlines on it and generate lots of traffic to their site that way, right? And so they and they have these tools where they can take and generate twenty five different um, headlines and then test which ones are the best and then use that headline and you know, get optimize everything and make these templates so that they can create as much traffic as possible. And so you have these slower news sources, say like the New York Times or something, trying to compete with that, and they're not getting that type of traffic because they're writing a story that maybe has a snooze or a headline, you know, relative to this like, you know, nine out of 10 people get this wrong about viruses, you know, so, oh, I have to know what that is. And they really go for that knowledge gap where it's like, you know, I have to know what, what, the, what the thing is, and we click on those kind of things, called clickbait. And that's how they, they generate traffic, they, and they get ad, you know, paid for ads in those ways, and uh, they're not even generating content necessarily, just, just the... Uh, just getting people to that spot. Ju yeah, with, with just, with just with headlines that are uh, incredibly tantalizing. And that is like, so with the whole net neutrality thing, which I, is a whole other thing, but that's the 
that's the issue with that, if I understand right, is that the, the throttle or the, they call it or the flow can be manipulated by the by the IP companies or the companies that he can Right. The pipe can't pipe can't can uh, can't pick and has to give everybody the same. It has to be neutral. Right, but we don't have that anymore. Right. So now they can and they can say, you know what? And and, and they've been complaining about that. Say with Google and stuff, they complain that Google's search algorithm might be bubbling up companies that they like better, or Amazon, right? You might, you might uh, search for some generic kind of thing, and it's, Amazon has all of these um, off-brand, you know, these brands that they make that you don't even know it's them, and that might, they might come up top, you know, top 10 of this or something like that. What's the best tent to buy? And oh well, we have a position with REI, so we're going to you know shift you there, whatever. All these kind of things, yeah. So that's been that's been one of the problems is how can you you know, uh, if it's an even playing field, it, it can be better for us. And that's what it was in the past, but now it's not that way anymore. So all these you know Comcast and stuff like that, they say, hey, if you want to have your you know your stuff delivered faster, you got to pay for the platinum service or whatever you know they're going to call it, right? Yeah. It's all I'm about money. They have a throttle of like Netflix and things like that. I mean, because every time I call into CenturyLink for something, I have to go through a whole sales pitch every time. Uh, I, I got a CenturyLink. I couldn't tell them. And finally, I get to somebody for my service or whatever. And I don't, you know, I have Netflix and then I have like over over the air antenna. Like it's just a mm -hmm. Amazon antenna. So I get like 30 channels free or whatever. So I cut the cord. But I'm surprised that they're trying to push cable so hard that they don't manipulate the. Netflix connection or something because because uh, Comcast you can go right to Netflix yeah you're right yeah like why yeah. I watch Netflix more than Comcast I don't know why I got to cut the cable just well and that's you know that think about that 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 is, is evolving so fast and you had like HBO and all these other what do you ones pay if you don't mind me asking for do you have internet yeah it's um it's it's the um, DSL okay. it's, it's I got a deal for a year for so you have it through your phone company thirty bucks and then it's like fifty megs or something now you it's, something it's twelve. It's okay. not even that much. It's not much, okay. Now it's like 45 because it went up after the deal was over. So. Right. Yeah, so about 50 bucks a month is what. Yeah. And then for, for cable TV, you can spend either, easily $100, $130 a month, you right? You only need 12 Mbps for, for Netflix, good Netflix. Yeah. For doing Netflix streaming? Well, because a lot of times what it'll do too is, is cash some of that into your device too so that it's streaming it out, not just right off the web, but you know, out of some memory in your right. iPad or you your tablet or something like that. No, I don't have a TV and I don't have cable and I haven't for years and years and years. And uh, but now I ha now I watch some Netflix and stuff because uh, and now too they were just saying last night you know stream the NFL uh, through iTunes uh, through Apple uh, streaming or something like that. So now they have a deal. And even a couple of years ago, you know, I watched uh, the Super Bowl just for free on my tablet and stuff. And uh, so and the, the last game of the Final Four and the March Madness. So some of the stuff you can get without having to have the, uh, the cable. But I found I was just watching too much and it was too, ex too expensive. My bro brother-in-law has cable, so I use his charter spectrum to like get the, you know, on the smart TV for ESPN and some other things. And then I get, he gets, you get four screens with Netflix, so I give him one and my sister. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people are doing that. Hulu, they, some people trade Hulu for Netflix. Exactly. I gotta get rid of mine. I pay way too much. Yeah. Think of how much money over a year, you know, and that would be if you save that money, you know, that's cash flow, right? It's just a good money management. And I just don't know how to do it. I, I need to take the, the plunge and just start getting them. Like, go on Amazon and look at over the air and OTA, it's called. It's just a, it's a antenna you just stick in your window. Hmm. And you, yeah. like, you get like really good yeah, HDTV. A lot of here you do really well. With really yeah. Well. I mean, you get, I get 30 channels or yeah. something like that. Like, you know, local news and like uh, what's the other one me tv and some of the channels that have older shows and yeah. stuff like that. it used to be that that's what we, you'd have an antenna on top of your house and that's how you got your television or you had rabbit ears where they call them right on top of the tv and television television was uh, broadcast that way from the antennas on the top of the mountain here but you know antennas and it would be broadcast yeah, like even the cable internet with cable and then using going 12 15 bucks a month for all that other stuff is great well, that's the thing right now. We still need either the copper wire DSL or something to get internet into the house, or apps. you need the cable, the cable coax into the house. Even if you didn't want the TV, you still, 
I think the biggest thing now is I, I, I don't need, you know, cable TV, but I need my internet. Right. Well, and, Google might change and, and Google and Facebook That's are looking to change that. I never even thought about that wider than I think. Yeah, where, you know, why, why there hasn't quite been so, such an extensive um, ability to uh, attach to the web via satellite. Um, and that's, you know, it's interesting that even DirecTV and, and you know, and that they really haven't gone in for, um, so I don't know if they just have a limited amount of availability on their satellites or what, you know, that they don't want to get into that web business. To get into the web business, that's a good point. An interesting aside, just let me tell you, because I think it's really fascinating. And uh, so, right, direct TV. So there's two different, there's a number of different ways that we get stuff into our house, right? We have the copper wires, and that's the old telephone wires. And they've made those so that they, it used to be that they could only have a band, a very limited bandwidth. A phone call was very limited, like 5K, like, you know, just a small amount of data. Now they've made it so they can get much more data down those two wires, and so it can take a data stream that can handle internet speeds. Then you have coaxial cable, which is a higher bandwidth cable. It can give you a higher bandwidth for uh, cable television, and also give you a higher bandwidth for higher uh, amount of uh, internet speed. And that, so we have those ways. We have the cellular that we get through our through our phone, right? And that's the that's the radio frequencies that are tiled in those little cellular antennas, just small, maybe five mile or less radius things, and you s switch between those antennas as you move around. And then the other way is it comes off of satellites. And satellites used to be more uh, restricted to big businesses and stuff, but in the last 10 years or so, you see lots of those dishes, you know, especially in other parts of the world, you know, there'll be a, you know, apartment complexes where everybody has their dish, you know, facing out there and they're all faced the same way. And, um, and, and it comes off of a satellite. And the way that that works is really fascinating. So I just want to take a second to, so you have, you have the earth, right? That's the earth. And, and the, the way that they thought of, of, it's called geosynchronous satellites. You have to have satellites that stay in the same place all the time. So, no, no, you're going like this, but you're right. But how did, how, what, what were you going to say? No, that's, that's it. Yeah. That's it. But it has to stay in the same place all the time, right? You have that dish, and that dish isn't moving like this. If you see spy satellites that the government has and stuff, the dishes actually move across the, you know, the sky because the satellites are on orbits that aren't geosynchronous and stayed in the same spot. Geosynchronous means that it stays in the same spot over the earth no matter what. How can you do that? Multiple. It's just one satellite. So this was done by, you know, uh, um, uh, the science fiction writer, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Good movie. But who's the guy who wrote that? Clark. Clark. Not Stanley Clark, but I can't think of his name now, but Clark, right? We'll think of it in a minute. I'll but just look, it up. look it up. Who wrote 2001? He was a science fiction writer, and he came up with this idea of satellites that could be oh, geo. Arthur, Arthur, Arthur C. Clark. Arthur C. Clark, thank you. And so, I'm going to do it. He's writing science fiction about it? He's a science fiction writer. He wrote 2001 Space Odyssey, lots of great science fiction. And one of his science fiction thoughts were if you, so the Earth turns, right? Mm -hmm. And the Earth revolves uh, um, totally around in 24 hours, right? Every day, the Earth revolves, right? right? So if you had, and we know the size of the Earth and all, and so if you put up a satellite, and it, had to be, it has to be right over the equator, right? Because that's the, that's the place where it's revolving around, right? It has to be right over the equator. And if you put a satellite and its orbit was out far enough that it would, as the Earth moved, it would move around the Earth at the same speed, right? That's what has to happen for this to stay in the same spot all the time. So that happens to be 23,000 miles up in the air, that, that, that the orbit, and it'll stay in the same spot. So that's a geosynchronous satellite. He thought of that in like the late 1950s or something. And, and then from science fiction, you know, um, Engineers started thinking, you know, that's actually possible. And they started putting up satellites that way. Now they've gone, at first they had, I think it was five degree spacing. And you'd, so all around the, the Earth, right, from the top, every five degrees, you could have another satellite. 
because you didn't want them too close together, they crash into each other, right? So that, then it got crowded. We needed more, we wanted more data, more satellite communication. So they started to, they went to two and a half degree spacing. And now they've gone and made satellites with better transponders and better, you know, uh, data carrying things, you know, because we have better, you know, uh, computer chips and all. So that's all those satellites are what make the geosynchronous satellite ring. And that's what does GPS is based on that, geo, geo positioning, right? And also our direct TV and things is, is off of these. So there's a, there's a satellite up there that is the direct TV satellite. And there's probably another one on the other side of the world, maybe four or five of them. And that's why when you see the, the uh, like here, all of the, all of the um, dishes are gonna point to the south because the equator is south of here and then a little bit, I don't know what, if it's east or west where the satellite is, but they're all positioned at the same thing. And they gotta be catching that satellite. Like right, they, they, fo they focus it in, and you don't even need a big giant dish anymore, right? It's just a little three inch pizza plate kind of thing, right? And uh, because the signals are powerful enough and, the, and the, uh, you know, the microphones in there basically are sensitive enough they can pick up a, a very slight signal. And that's, that's how that works. So you're right, they could, get, they could definitely get into the internet business and be a competitor, and I'm surprised they're not, because that is more, um, I think, becoming more of a compelling use case for us now than, than um, cable TV. Is it not, it's not as fast, though. Hmm? The satellite's not as quick, though. You can't get enough. Well, if it can, if it can put down video, it can definitely put down a so, decent, a decent bandwidth of, of internet. I'll just tell you, so I had DSL. I think. Or well, D DSL is the is the two. Well, I go like the two wires, you know, copper wires. I had out. satellite yeah. in this house. They they didn't have cable around it. There's the plumbing wasn't there, and they could give me. I can't remember the exact megabytes, but Comcast came and was like, "I'll give you 250 megabytes." Right. So how are they doing that? With because that's what I'm saying. If, to be competitive, you, you need to go. There's a gig now. Uh, right, you have to have you have to have the super fast. Yeah, the super fast. Uh, so now, um, and who's pushing those kind of things? Who's pushing those numbers? Up? It's not even television as much as gaming. Really, I think is what yeah. oh, you yeah. know. Gaming is gaming has pushed all kinds of tech. You know, um, a lot of the artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, cranking out. Or, or Bitcoin, right? When you mine Bitcoin, you have to go through all these incredible calculations to figure out, to solve this problem, and then you get Bitcoin. And so what are the fastest chips and processing units that have been out there are these gaming boards that NVIDIA makes. And so the, the Bitcoin people and the artificial intelligence people and all have been buying up all of those processors so you can't buy them. They're really hard to buy. Another supply and demand thing, right? The, the demand has gotten so huge, it's the supply can't keep up. And it's not the gaming industry per se, but the gaming industry drove that whole business. And it'll probably drive virtual reality. You know, the goggles will you know, be driven by that. And uh, um, so, so these different technologies uh, or, or these different entertainment things that we want to do drive the technology and, and make it. Think about even with television, you know, or you look at an old movie, and I'm talking about an old movie from 2005, right? And it's maybe you're in like, you know, some sort of secret government, super duper computer place, but you see everybody has, you know, uh, cathode ray, you know, big box uh, monitors on their desk. And so, you know, it looks antiquated, right? It doesn't look as flat screen took over. Um, and, and suddenly everybody had to buy at new TVs. What an incredible way to make a new market, right? It's just like, your TV was perfectly fine, right? It was working, but yeah, it's too big. Or your computer monitor was perfectly fine. Now you have to have a flat screen, and uh, flat screens have just uh, have completely everybody, every place, and everybody had to have a flat screen now. And now they're super duper inexpensive too, because as you build lots more of them, the price drops because in quantity, once they learn how to make it a quantity, then uh, they can they can start to drop the drop the costs because it's cheaper for them to manufacture. That's the question. What is next? You know. Um, so when it comes to marketing, we have all those different kinds of things, right? We're, and we're and we're making what we're trying to do is initially with with this Aida is generate awareness, right? So the whole thing is awareness campaigns. How do you make anybody aware of your product so that they can at least 
think about it, right? That's the first part. And then you start to go down this, this, um, this sales funnel, this marketing funnel. You put the brass fitting right in front of your face. That's the awareness now. Right, right. That's the awareness, yeah. And they, and they, they can tell that. And you were already showed the intention. So it's like, here's some, and deliver the right product to the right person, yeah. you know? And they're not like saying, to everybody, who wants a brass fitting? Anybody want a brass fitting? And I was like, nope, you've shown an interest. Here it comes, Very incredibly targeted, right? So you start to do these different calls to action along this, and these are sort of mini calls to action until you get to the one, the call to action that's actually the purchase, right? I'm that's surprised that's the key. I'm surprised these people, though, for telling me, you made me buy that you know, $20,000 worth of goods I don't really need. Has anyone ever challenged, or is that part of the disclaimer? No one is. I, I don't know of any cases yet where they've been where they've been uh, challenging yeah, people. I bet it, I bet it might be part of the disclaimer though. You can't come back after. It's like there's some kids stuff where they're making. Oh, you shouldn't market to kids like that. Mm -hmm. Making them, you know, eat sugary cereals or stuff. It's kind of interesting how they haven't. Um, you know. They were ruthless about that, you know. I mean, I remember growing up Saturday morning cartoons. You know. Yeah. I gotta have Lucky Charms and I gotta have Cocoa Puffs and all this kind of yeah. stuff, right? Yep. Captain Crunch, all these kind of things, and they're just, and of course, kids love it because it tastes so good. It's on, yeah, it's on the bottom <laughs> shelf, and and, uh, and toys. You know, you got to have that toy because you heard about the, the whole, um, you know. I, I was thinking of My Little Pony. I don't know if anybody, you know, yeah, but there's, a, do you know, there's a whole, a a, a group. Of, you ever Bromies? They're middle-aged guys that are into My Little Pony. Oh, my God. It's a whole thing. I'm not kidding. I called Bromies. It's a whole. It's a whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, Bromies. Awesome. They're into My Little Pony. I don't understand it, but it's like, you know, that, that's, they, they, <laughs> they like the My Little Pony. So. You just don't admit that. They, but that's a segment, you know, that's a segment of the market that I'm sure when they made the My Little Ponies, they weren't thinking, that's, that's a segment we're going to, you know, target. But now, you know, they're probably power users because they have discretionary income and, so they can buy all the My Little Ponies. It's crazy. And when retail stores get there, it's just going to be all digital. This will totally be digital marketing world. In the next 20 years, it'll all be online. Well, there's a lot of things like that, too. You know, think of this. Um, we only started to even uh, explore uh, 3D printers. And we probably will have 3D printers. First of all, they're going to have them at the space station, right? Because then they don't, it's $10,000 to upload, I think it's 10000 or maybe $10 million, to upload a, uh, a pound of payload, you know, out of escape velocity into the, it's a lot, right? Yeah. And so it's expensive to put up, uh, you know, different types of uh, um, spare parts and if something gets broken. So they're making, on the space station and other things where you'll have 3D printers so that if, if one of the little latches on a locker or something breaks, you just print a new one and you replace it instead of like, okay, on the next space, you know, the next launch, you're gonna have to bring up, uh, you know, that or something. So you can do it right away and it'll be done and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to upload it, it's already up there. So they're thinking about that's gonna be, come into our homes too, right? And so say, you know, we buy plastic forks or whatever it is kind of things, and, and they're using metals now too and all to do. You know how 3D printing works? It's additive mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of milling where you take something and, and take away, subtractive kind of stuff, you actually add in layers like ink on a printer, you build up a 3D model of whatever it is you want. You can do it in plastic, you can do it in metals now, you can do it in carbon fiber and See all kinds of materials. Boxing? You can do it in epoxies. Yeah, it's crazy. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff, and and they're just starting to get even better. And making a lot of products too, where with subtractive stuff you can't hollow out the inside and make it super light. But when you're doing it additively, you can make devices and things that don't have the extra metal or the extra mass that you don't need, and keep it really strong too. So they're. Uh, Airbus, I think, made all of the latches for one of their planes or something in 3D printer and reduced the, the plane weight by 500 pounds or something. You know, really interesting stuff. So, how about that? The whole, like, well, they're doing. Just think of all the products you can make at home that you're not going to buy. It, or, or, or you'll, you'll buy, right, you'll, you'll buy the. They're doing it with guns, right? That's yeah, been that's a big, that's that's been a big thing. These plastic, plastic guns. Well, you, right, exactly. It could be that way soon where. 
You want a 19, 1955 Chevy brass fitting yeah. for this, and, and it takes the brass stuff and makes the fitting, and maybe it was brass before, and now it's a carbon fiber, whatever it is, but they will have all of these different, and they're even talking about that they can take from the atmosphere, because the atmosphere has carbon, and even the carbon loading that we've been doing might be beneficial for making carbon fiber stuff. Suddenly we can, we don't even have to, we can literally make things out of thin air, where we just, you know, it'll, maybe it'll be a vacuum thing outside your house, it'll, it'll sequester the carbon out of the atmosphere and build you a fork and knife and a drinking spoon, I mean, a drinking cup or something. And makes it into uh, makes it into stuff. So so that kind of you know digital downloads of physical goods um, could be happening soon, where we don't have to worry anymore about the channels, you know, the distribution channels. How do we get things from here to here? Just download the digital file and make the you know the guns have been the big thing. I don't know if you've heard about this, but mm -hmm. they're they're making there's this whole issue around there's these uh, schematics or three D model plans out there to make a fully you know, functional gun out of plastic. And you can make it on your 3D printer at home as a, as a hobbyist and have a gun that doesn't even show up in metal detectors. And it works, and you can just make it at home. You know, it's like, wow. So think about that for any type of, you know, terrorist thing or something, you just have a 3D printer, you go in, you don't even have to walk in with it, and then you go build it inside and you got your thing or whatever, it's just all kinds of, well, probably also things can happen with that. Probably also with kids because you know back then when you wanted to do a gun, you had a gunsmith. That was some you had to have a lathe and a mill. Oh this, yeah. Kids are smarter than I've seen little kids on uh, Apple, like a two-year-old on Apple iPad. Yeah, can make so can make something. Go make a gun. <laughs> but I mean, so so it won't even be just we're moving towards digital products. You know, like digital downloads. You can buy a book for your Kindle. And you could buy it, you know, sitting on the beach in Mallorca and just read whatever book you wanted right there, not even having to move, right, from the poolside, you know, in Ibiza or whatever. And, uh, and we can do that, with, or you can watch whatever movie on the airplane. You know, you can download things before you go, so you have all the, all Is the stuff you want to do. Is there room for any little guys? I know you, there's always room for a little guy. I mean, marketing, there was always room. When I took marketing, it was always said, there's always room for someone else. It just seems like with some, if someone captures this technology so soon, they just could, like the Googles and the, these trillion dollar companies, they can just keep buying these little guys up all the competition. And it seems like this monopoly is kind of starting to form on this stuff. Oh yeah, no, there's no question that that, that it's aggregated to these big these big companies, and they've they're bought the first ones in and they're they've bought a lot of you know they've acquired. A, but think about it's also made for um, companies now can be formed very quickly with not a lot of money up front, and that's what's happened with Silicon Valley and the whole startup culture, right? It's like you know, three people in a in a in a in an apartment for six months can make an incredible product just on their computers, and it could be financed by some venture capital or an angel investor for twenty five thousand dollars, and suddenly it's worth you know five million dollars or ten million dollars or two hundred million dollars, and one of these other big companies gobbles it up because either they want the technology or they want to take away the competition or something like that or so mar marketing and digital age. So yes, there is there's tons of room for small people. Marketing and digital age digital age, age I got uh, I just I just got these uh, invisible lines so I kind of I stutter now. Um, it seems like you have to use their platform. You absolutely do. You have to use their platform, but as you go through the platform, then you have all these access to all the folks, but you do have to use that that's the kind of thing. So Here's when we're talking about when we're talking about marketing, digital marketing. There's there's three ways to think about it, right? There's three channels, and that's where you have to be careful. So there's there's your your owned channel, right? And there's uh, your earned, and then there's the paid. And what you want to do is you want to migrate as much as you can to your owned. Right, and because that's what you control. And there's really two things in the owned that you actually own. Your website is your property, and your mailing list. So those are the two things that are portable and can go with you, right? Now, if you build up a big following on, just like, say, InfoWars, right? Um, what's that guy's name? I can't. Alex Jones. Alex Jones, right? Huge business, 
you know, selling questionable sensationalism stuff and all, and um, made it a giant, and using that then to sell products, but he had a giant Twitter following, a giant YouTube following, a giant Facebook following, all these things, and then because uh, he finally ran afoul of their, you know, uh, the platform, they, kicked their, him off. they kicked him off, right. So they kicked him off the platforms, and now he doesn't have any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> so. That's an, that's an extreme case, but say in, in other milder cases, um, I had a big Facebook following, right? And I put out posts and everything like that, and it would go out to everybody, all my followers and friends, and they could read it and all. Then change, Facebook changed the rules and said, hey, if you wanna, you know, it would be like all of a sudden 13 people saw this. Like 13 people saw this, what the heck is going on? If you want more people to see it, you can boost your post. To boost your post, you just pay us, and then we, average, you know, send it out to lots more people. And so they, by changing the rules, I didn't own that platform, right? So suddenly my business model got pulled out from under me, and that kind of thing. LinkedIn is doing that to me. I've, I've never known anybody. Just recently, I joined LinkedIn. LinkedIn does it. Social. Twitter, yeah. you know, whenever they change the rules, yeah. whenever they change the rules, your business model sure. changes too, and and a lot of times suffers because then they want, they want to charge you or they limit how many people see it or whatever it is. You know, they change the algorithms or something and suddenly I'm not getting the kind of traction and, and, uh, and audience response I was before for the same kind of things. Why is that? They change the stuff. So really what you want to do is try to migrate to your owned things that you control and then if you send out an email to all your people then they can, you know, they see it and, and you know it and they can either open it or not or click on the links in it or not but at least it's all done that way. Now, we talked a little bit about, about websites, and there's a, a number of Wix, and there's all these other different sites that are relatively simple that come with integrated paywalls, and you can set up a store relatively quickly with Stripe or something like that, you know, these different paywall services and all. But one that's really good is WordPress. It's the de facto standard, so it's like using Word or Excel, you know, you kinda, everybody's using it, so. There's lots of plugins and you can make it work really easy. So that's a good platform that way. And you have to have it hosted, right? There has to be a physical place where the data goes. And I happen to use Southwest Cyberport, which is a local company. But a lot of times people use GoDaddy or these other services. How do you do your website? Southwest Cyberport. Just good local folks. I really like it. It might be a little more expensive, but it's not that much money. And they're really, I like it that I can call somebody up and they, you know, they're, they're there and they're real people where these other sites, you know, it, it's more nebulous who's doing and what they're doing. And like GoDaddy will give you a one year where they'll host your site for like five bucks and give you a free domain name, and all, and which is great. But then when the next year rolls around and they've got you on their platform, then suddenly it's, you know, $75 a month to, you know, to host with us or something. You know, it's like, oh. So, you, 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 so, but that, that's your property, and then if you have that, you have a domain name, right? So the www, whatever the name is, .com or dot .whatever, that's, that's your property. You own that property, and you could take it from Southwest Cyberport and go, you know, migrate it to another ser you know, server service as well, um, and you own that, and all of your you know, site would go along, migrate along with you. Same with your email list, and one of the best email list things, anybody have an email list? Anybody do that? E an email list? I had a store. If you're doing, if you're doing marketing. No, I had a store in 06 and I had an email list. You had an email list. It was small. But now the, great, the best one, I think, is MailChimp. It's called MailChimp. They like to use these you know, monkey and mail name, you know, chip names, but MailChimp is fantastic. There's other ones, too. What is MailChimp? What is it? You just buy a list from someone? No, you make your own mailing list. So, so you'd have you know, people that have bought your products or people that are interested, and then you send them out content, right? And MailChimp is free up to 2,000 people in your list. And last year, they have these automation services where you can make a whole bunch of emails that then if somebody new comes in, you can onboard them, you know, send them 10 emails, one a week or whatever kind of thing, you know. And you've made those in advance and they'll go out to those kind of new, new people. Or you can make a series of emails that might do a whole sort of series of funnel kind of things. Um, and that automation used to cost 200 bucks a month to, to get through MailChimp. Well, last May, a year ago, May, they made it free. 
So it's a free service with this automation, up to 2,000 people on your list. And over that, then it becomes, I think, $50 a month, up to 10,000 or something. Um, but really remarkable service, and you can build your email list. So when we're talking about digital marketing, the big words are, the big, the big uh, concepts are building a platform, right, in this way. And the way you build a platform is I'm going to take this um, earth now and make this will be say your website right this is your 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 um, hub they call it they call it hub and post but it's your website basically and all the outposts are like your social media sites and things right so you might have Instagram and you might have Pinterest and you might have Twitter and you might have Facebook and you might have LinkedIn and you'd have and snapchat or whatever and you have all these different services and you're, you're posting to those services and you can post automated to those services right you have say hundreds or you know a lot of different posts that you've done in the past that might be informational to a degree and and so you have a service out here that's posting to these guys right and then as people see those if they click on the link it might take them to your website or maybe it takes them to your Amazon page where they buy your book or something or whatever right so one of the things you do though is you might you might say like uh, you know get my free um, uh, information on um, whatever it is, how to cook 12, you know, meals that take less than five minutes or whatever it would be. Or, or in my case, it's like, you know, get my free uh, uh, book on understanding financial statements. And I actually, I give that away for free, right? And on MailChimp, they do, uh, yeah, MailChimp does that automatically. You put up the PDF file or whatever. And then when people come on to, the, on to your site or whatever, they click on that and it, they download the thing and, and the only thing that they give is their first name and the email address. How do you make money on that? Have, ever, have any of you ever done those kind of things where you get get something and you give your email list and oh, then you yeah, get yeah, mailers yeah, for something? Okay. From REI or from, from what, what have you done with? Uh, REI is one for sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I haven't done that. I, or I no? Have, I but but you, do you get email? Do you get emails in your email stream from oh, yeah. people like selling you stuff? And you know it's like you know. Well, I've got a guy. I or somebody ta telling you how to you know make a million dollars with my special marketing campaign or whatever. I'm an Excel guy like you. That's a smart guy that sends me Excel tips. And he's always like, come sit, check my book out. We got a free seminar stuff. And I just kind of boggles me how. You Somehow you gave him your e you gave him. Your, you gave him your email in order to get some kind of free thing. Yes. And, and, and that, that's exactly what I'm talking and about. And that would go to that MailChimp? That's, yes, that's, that's, the front end, that's the front end of this, right? And that's called lead capture. You're doing lead capture because then you become a lead, right? You become a lead. And what you do is you give away something for free in exchange for the email address. And then that email address gets populated into your mailing list, MailChimp in this case. And then you start sending out regular tips on this or that and that's called content marketing so you're you're selling it's not you're not selling anything at this point you're just giving providing information and starting to generate trust with the customer and they're understanding what your services are and then there might be after there's a one Gary V I don't know if you heard that guy but he wrote a book called uh, you know uh, jab 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 punch and it's like information 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 sell you know where you where you kind of you, you give information for a while and then oh by the way if you're really interested in this I'm having a webinar next Thursday afternoon for you know six you know sixty nine dollars or go buy my book and it'll tell you more about this or my Udemy course is blah 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 you know whatever it is or you know if you're really interested in, I, I'm selling these diet pills for you know whatever it is kind of thing right so you start with this you get the lead capture and then you do content marketing you, you deliver content that is of real value you know it has to be of real value or people are just going to not open it or 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 unsubscribe and you can unsubscribe all the time and that's that's a requirement MailChimp has at the bottom of every email and unsubscribe so people don't have to get them if they don't want to right so you have to make it compelling enough that people don't un unsubscribe and that people start going down this funnel too you know so and it might take it might take 10 emails or 100 emails or whatever to, or interactions to gain that trust. But at some point, you might buy something from that person. You might buy something from REI. You know, you might see something, it's like, wow, this is, you know, it's their Labor Day sale. And really, they have those, you know, those sandals I always wanted. Oh, okay, I'm going to get them. You know, whatever, because you've, 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 you've come to trust them in some way or they've become part of your, your life, you know. So every clothing store you go in there, Express, REI, they always ask, can I get your email? So that's why they're doing it. Absolutely. You already, you already know you're buying the product. You're in the store. Right. But, but, but well, that's the other part of this. Once, 
it, 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 this funnel is called get, keep, and grow, right? You keep the customer then, and then you grow the customer, right? So you want to have customer satisfaction. You want to, how, how did you like what we got? Da, da, da. You have any problems with it? Da, da, da. Oh, would you also like to buy a service contract, or would you like to buy this other thing that and goes along with it? Da, da, da. Right, exactly. And, and so once you're a customer, then you're predisposed to their stuff, they know. And so, exactly, whenever you go up, it's like, and what's your email address? They're, 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 you know, why do we need that? Well, because okay, they're going to be sending you send so stuff. Says, well, oh, get your receipt to your email address. Oh, very tricky. Exactly. Do you, want, yeah, do you want to send your, exactly. And that's what they're, they're doing, the lead capture. That's what they're doing at this front end. And that is the first step. Once you make people aware, you want to get them into your owned list, right? And then you want to start delivering stuff. Now. The earned, what earned means is earned is out here in your social media world. Earned is, and we'll talk about that on, thir on Wednesday, virality, being viral kind of content, content that people are willing to share, right? So if it's something that's, that's an earned kind of thing, that's where you make content that's so good that somebody has to, I got to share that with my friend. I, Joe has to hear about this, or Sally needs to know about this, whatever it is, you know. Um, and you start sharing that kind of information, that's the best kind of marketing. Word of mouth, right? This thing is so great, I can't believe it. You gotta try it, it's really wonderful. I went on this trip and it was the best time I ever had. Whatever it is, that type of word of mouth from peers is really the best, right? So that's what earned means, when any, any type of content that, that you create that then gets shared. And each time it gets shared, then it reaches a whole new audience and all that. And the third is paid, when you pay for boosting your Twitter feed, boosting your Facebook ad, boosting, uh, you know, buying the Google AdWords and stuff like that. And that's, that's really can be very, very powerful, but you have to pay for it. And, uh, but if you add that into your marketing mix, and if you start to say that the, the, the cost of, uh, of customer acquisition cost, right, CAC, the customer acquisition cost to go through all this, you got their lead, right, or whatever, um, and you got that through a paid click, and then to get them to, or, or maybe to get them to go here and have a couple more clicks and then they go buy your thing. Say if, you're, if your product cost $25, right? And you're, you, you discover that your average cost of acquisition, a customer acquisition cost is $15 because you had to buy three $5 click through ads to get them to finally buy. On average, just statistically, right? Is that a deal you should do? Yeah, you just start plowing money into this because it's a money making machine, right? You put in 15, you get 25 out. Same you know, do that all day long, right? You're making $10 and you start doing that at volume, it starts becoming real money, right? That's how, how you think about these kind of advertising things. Now, a lot of, a lot of guys will say, you know, a lot of, you know, People that try to operate up in here will say that, um, you know, advertising, you know, paid is, um, what is it? Um, uh, advertising is like sex, only losers pay for it, something like that. You know, this, this is like, but, but, but if you do pay for it, you know, it's, it's, um, it, can be, it can be very, very uh, lucrative if it's done right. But if you can actually do it earned wise, like if you can figure out viral type of clickbait, you know, uh, titles and things that get people in and then they actually click onto your stuff, that's even a better way to do it because it doesn't cost you any money, right? So you want to get people to go, and then the next call to action might be another, you know, get another free something or other, and then maybe buy something, and, and then buy some more things, and then, and then grow, those, grow those customers. So that's, so now, let's think about this, right? Say if the first thing they bought was $25, and it cost you $40, to acquire that, that person. Well, you're losing $15 a, a pop, right? But what if, on average, what they call the lifetime value, say most of your customers or a percentage of them really like your stuff, they buy the first thing for $25, but then over the next six months or something, they end up spending another $25, so they pay $50 and it costs you $40 to get them. This is another good deal to do, right? Even on the front end, if it's because that's still part of your marketing chain, and this might even be a lost leader on the front end to get people into your thing, and then they buy more things. You know, like so. So it might be something you don't make too much money on that first purchase, 
but it, they seem like it's such a value, and then they start, then they buy something else that might give you more margin. Do this, does your marketing team do this, or does the finance team do this, or is it a combo of both? Well, that's the thing. You know, it used to be that um, marketing was. Uh, did anybody watch Mad Men or those kind of shows? No, you know, good, well, you know, like um, back in the in the '60s, TV ruled, and so there was all these big Madison Avenue firms that Young and Rubicam and Ogilvy and Mather and uh, J. Walter Thompson and these giant firms, and what they would do is make these ad campaigns for Lucky Strikes or for Seven Up or whatever, and they'd be on television and all, and those would be the way that it that that then the advertising would it would almost be a self fulfilling pro prophecy, right? There was there was three networks. If you put a bunch of money into ads, you were going to drive a bunch of demand to your product because there wasn't that many other things. So a lot of the advertising, marketing was more of an advertising game and it was more about schmoozing the client to make a big ad spend so that then you could do that and then you could show them success. What's happened now with the digital end of things is it's more of an engineering game, right? You have to know how to do all this kind of coding. You want to embed and bake this type of virality into the products. You want to understand the, the, and finesse every customer touch point along the customer journey. All that kind of stuff is you want to be part finance person, part creative person. The creative didn't go away. You still have to make compelling sure. copy messaging and compelling images that are aspirational and all. And then you also have to have an engineering and a finance kind of background too. So it's a lot of what they call growth hacking, where you're hacking this type of behavior you know, it comes from computer hacking. You're, you're creating this kind of behavior uh, and trying to make people uh, buy stuff and then tell their friends in some way that then it, it expands and grows through the product itself and through these digital channels. Yeah. That's what you're trying to do there. Yeah, so really at the end of the day, the equation is that the lifetime value has to be greater than the cost of acquisition. That's the key thing that we're trying to drive in this get, keep, grow funnel. And you're starting on the front end where you're with awareness campaigns, getting people aware, driving them to your website or through your paywall or through your channels in some way to get them to buy your stuff. And sometimes that takes, and they call this, this activity here, Seth Godin, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's a, he's a big marketing guru guy. And he coined the phrase um, permission marketing. And this is all permission marketing, where you're, you're asking permission to send, them send you stuff, right? And so you do that by some sort of a quid pro quo, some sort of trade. I'll give you this informative piece of literature if you give me your email address. And then you're giving me permission to sell to you over time. So, and then we sell to you with content. And that's why people have blogs, right? Because blogs are informational, and then that could drive them through this kind of thing. And then sooner or later, hopefully, they buy whatever you're, you know, whatever you're going to make money on. But a lot of times, these parts here are not money makers. They're the front end where, um, but they're not cost. You know, they're relatively costless too. To to make a blog on Medium is free. To make your email list with Mailchimp is free. Up to two thousand people. Does Mailchimp ever sell that stuff? Sounds like they have a lot of power. If they know. No, 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 no. They don't sell your list or anything. No, that is your well, list. They're giving it to you for free. They give it to you free. Well, they hope they after two thousand, you know, oh, then perfect. then they start charging you fifty bucks a month. Okay. And That's so, but by then you're happy to pay that because you have an sure. email list of four thousand or five thousand or ten thousand people. More 50 bucks a month. And and yeah, hopefully you're making more than. <laughs> 50 bucks a month, right. But, so they, they, that's part of the rules. They will not sell it. That's oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. That is a big part of the rules. Sure a lot of people would run away from them if they, if they Yeah, exactly, them. exactly. And there's other services, too, that'll do this. Emma's one, uh, Constant not Contact. Not hard to get 2,000 email addresses either these days. It's what? Not hard to get 2,000 email addresses these days. No, you can't. But honestly, it's a lot harder. Marketing is hard. It's hard to get tens of thousands of followers on Twitter or... You know, it's amazing that some of these sites get just, you know, or, or millions of reads of this or that or the other thing. I mean, it's remarkably difficult. Um, and it just takes time of really, you know, looking at what's popular. And then there's these services too that uh, tell you, and even on Twitter, you know, tell you what, what topics are trending. You know, so if you want to ride that way, you can say, oh, this topic is trending. I can write something that sort of has a, uh, a clickbaity title that is, you know, 
tailgating on, you know, drifting off the back of that trending topic, whatever it is. Or you can write things, but my things that I do is more ever, what they call evergreen, where it's like stuff that I, I don't do anything that's topical because I don't want it to be, you know, the freshness dating on it. I don't want it to be out of date in six months and I got to write something else. I write some, like an article on what is NPV or, you know, it's not really going to change too much or, you know, those kind of things. So I try, in my, because I'm lazy, I just want to make a lot of evergreen content that I can keep churning out, you know, yeah, over time. Yeah, that's what they call it, is evergreen, because it, it can be used sure. over and over and it never goes out of date, you know, kind of thing. So, It says low battery. Oh. <laughs> well, I, you know, it worked the other day. I'm hoping it works again. I think you were in the shot the whole time. Oh, good. And I have my zipper up, I think, too, so everything's. <laughs> you crop it out. So we've talked about a lot of stuff, you know, SEO, the keywords, landing pages, keep, grow, you know, get, keep, grow. That's pretty much what I had on this. And then I, there's a bunch of really good videos, um, and I want to show them to you, but I don't want to waste a lot of time in class. You know, we don't have that much time in class to really go through. But I think I'll email them to you. Two, two um, programs that I, I want to send to you that are really good. One is... How long are they? Um, one is a... Uh, it's about maybe... One's called a micro MOOC or something. Like MOOC is uh, Massively Online Open Courses, and they've become very popular. and because they're free and they're, you know, you can get them. And, but this is from a group called A16Z. I talked about them last week. Andreessen Horowitz. And, um, and this is called numerology, not numerology, but something where, where uh, computer guys like, it, between the A and the Z of Andreessen and Horowitz is 16 letters. Um, and that's A16Z.com. And they have one, I'll send you the link. It's about a dozen two minute videos on sales, all things sales. Andrew Zine Horowitz is the, one of the premier venture capital firms. Did I did all things sales? Oh, did I? Okay. Those are great. They're all about sales and they're by, by cutting edge. I mean, these guys are cutting edge Silicon Valley, investing in all the greatest companies. So it's really, you know, spot on. Is that his first email? Cutting edge. Uh, I, th I thought I did, but I, I couldn't remember. And then there's another one I want to go into on, uh, on Friday, talk on, on Wednesday, talk about growth hacking and viral content. And there's a great guy at Wharton, the Wharton School. That's where I got my MBA. And uh, he's a teacher. He looks like he's about 20 years old. But he's a brilliant Jonah Berger. He's a brilliant um, modern marketing guy. And he wrote a book called Contagious. It's all about viral marketing. and. Um, and by viral marketing, it means the things that, you know, an article goes out and suddenly everybody knows about it and, you know, it's gotten super duper popular and all this kind of stuff. Um, and he has, a, he has one on Coursera, and Coursera is one of these MOOC platforms. And so this is a, a course from Wharton, which is the most one of the most prestigious uh, MBA programs in the world. One of these professors that it used to be only, you know, 100 people could take a seminar, 50 people, you know. Now everybody, and it's free. You can take it for free. And so, you know, taking advantage of that is just really remarkable. And um, you don't even have to read his book. You can just take the free course. How do these people make money? You, you know, you're saying. Well, they're in the funnel. They're going to sell it to you later, right? Right. Maybe later on. And, and I, I, I'll probably buy his book at some point, but I haven't yet. But uh, Jonah, I'm going to buy your book at some point, I promise. And uh, right, but you, you start to, you know, get, gain trust and, uh, and it helps the brand, you know, it gets Wharton's name out there and it gets his name out there and all those kind of things. So there's lots of um, positive reasons for doing that type of, this type of content marketing and for, for branding purposes. Pretty cool. So like, like say for your banker, you know, you could do a thing where it's, uh, you know, the, the top 10 tips of personal finance, how to get your finances in order, you know. Yeah. And, and number one, don't spend more than you make, or whatever kind of thing, you know, obvious kind of things or whatever, but it could, you know, open a bank account, have it, you know, and you could give that away for people to get, just to get their, st and then you get their email address, and then you cultivate them, and before you know it, you know, they become, uh, you know, uh, bankers at your place, because you say, do you know that we have, 
special, easy banking, this or that. Really? Oh, I didn't know that, you know. Whatever. All our bankers, I'm not a banker, but all our bankers, uh, they, they all are on boards, you know, they, that's how they network and stuff. So. Yeah, I, I was just, but as an right example. The, but you're right on the, um, let's probably old school thinking, they should be doing what you just said. I mean, if I was a banker and I was, a, you know, owned a branch, not owned, but manage a branch, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, and then you bring bring in the people, and you target just people in a certain zip code within the or your customers around your. Do you want to get be on my mailing list? I give. Yeah, I'll give you free stuff about um, the best retirement plan or the best da 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 da. Whatever the products that you sell, why they're good, but couched in a way that it seems like it's doing them a service. So you know? exactly, that's yeah. That's, that's yeah. You could do the same with your you know, with your physical therapy business and stuff, right? Yeah. The best way is not to dislocate your shoulder or something. <laughs> MBA ASAP. MBA ASAP.